this is a uh, security risk mitigation. I'm kind of a pacer, so I, I'll try to balance it out a little bit, but my voice can only be carried in the back of the room. What this seminar on is on is just kind of the risk, the loss, some of the mitigation, some of the common sense issues that you need to, to know. And a lot of you will probably be shaking your head during the presentation, but yeah, yeah, I know that, or that makes sense. But this isn't a presentation of saying you want to use Cisco, you want to use WatchGuard, you want to use anything else. It's more of creating a security infrastructure, process and procedures that is going to be interactive within your company and actually work. You spend a million dollars on the security system, but if your users spend a million hours trying to circumnavigate it, it's a failure. You spend a thousand dollars on something that actually will work, a thousand that seems to cheap. Ten thousand dollars on something that procedurally your users actually appreciate and actually like, which hopefully I'll be able to present today. Then you have a secure and you have a successful security integration system and all of everything that comes with it. A little bit, um, how many of you guys, huh? I just wanted to add something yes. for users. If you can instill the fear of whatever it is they're doing is, is so tremendous, fear works fantastic when mm -hmm. your users from uh, big suit. <laughs> right. We'll talk about that too. A um, little bit as far as with uh, CCB, most of you probably know us, worked with us, not as, or done some research, but just here's the, the sales slide that I put in there, okay? Why security? You hear everything, I mean, I could give story upon story upon story. The one thing that I've done a lot in the last five years is I do Homeland Security and compliance for FBI. So I work with police agencies, Milwaukee Police Department's my largest, but police agencies all over the, the nation, most of the Midwest, where basically something called CEGIS, Criminal Justice Information Services, which is a compliance that these departments have got to adhere to to be able to get into the criminal database system, which is NCIC nationally. Here in Wisconsin, it's called TIME. So the Department of Justice here in Wisconsin has to go out and make sure that you're following this 126-page manual on just IT compliance. And a lot of people are like, okay, well, you hear about some of the things like with Target and some of the others. The one thing that's really funny is that in a lot of cases, something like a police department is going to be hacked for a completely different reason than something like a Target or whatever. 89%, this is an FBI statistic, of all companies have been hacked. What the hackers do is basically sit and wait. Everything's open, a home IP address, you know, mother-daughter cupcakes, Target. If they can get into that, they will sit and wait. Could be a week, it could be two years, or they could just get bored. But you already have been watched and been hacked. A lot of uh, school districts, a couple here in the, in the state of Wisconsin, southeast of Wisconsin, got hacked on May 2nd. Both school districts. It's an important date because the first week of May is when they send final transcripts out to universities. And they start getting ready for the graduation times as far as with June. So when all of a sudden you're getting hit with an attack that says $2,000 prepaid debit card, and they're out of Kiev, Russia, and the FBI says we have no jurisdiction, and you have all, you know, 13,000 students that you have got to get transcripts out and get, you know, for the seniors graduation stuff together, they paid it. Both of the school districts paid it. What's actually bad is one of the school districts had a company come in, do a security assessment, and they got hacked that next September at the beginning of school. So um, if in case you do get hacked on something like that, really make sure to do it. We'll talk about testing your vendors, testing you know some of your IT personnel. Again, like I said, everybody's has been hacked. A lot of times that we do penetration testing. Uh, I've done it for like a lot of small police departments up north where it's like, well, no one's going to hack us. We're just a small police department who's not maybe trying to get some data. Well, that's out of a dare. A lot of people do like police departments 
not malicious to try to you know set something up, but as a dare to see if they can get in there, number one. And then number two, to possibly do some malicious things, trying to get data, you know, from the, the CGIS databases and trying to do that kind of stuff. But it's not as malicious as something like a company. My view on this and the people I've spoken to in the FBI is like they're more afraid of hacking and trying to down a police department than a business. You know, I think it's, you know, taken a little more serious. So they're just gonna try to do funny things a little bit, just try to see if they can get in there. But again, if it's something like I always use the cupcake business because this has happened in Racine, it was a mother-daughter cupcake <coughs> business that got hit with the phishing attack that they lost their credit card numbers and everything else because, and the wild thing is they use a processing system, a credit card processing company, but the tunnel between the processing company and them was not secure enough, so once they got into the cupcakes, they could get into the processing company. So it's again, everything that you have outside of you is gonna be an effect on this. Every person in the world, they, they say on average, it's 2.8 devices per person. 25 billion devices, that's a lot of places for people to just see if they can get in and see what can happen. And then in case of Target, I don't know how many of you know as far as how they actually got hacked, it's an outside vendor. What they ended up doing is they got into an outside vendor, one of their high back vendors that didn't have secure tunnels that had PCL integration and to be able to do the monitoring for their environmental controls and that pipe and that, that VPN tunnel was not secure enough. And so they got into the first company, jumped another company, jumped another company, ultimately got into Target, got into some of their Wi-Fi systems, and then got all of those credit cards. They say it probably took a little over about a year and a half for that to happen. But then you have something like Home Depot where they got directly in and it took you know a month or whatever. They just had the right way of getting in. We've spoken about this stuff, the mind of a hacker. What are they gonna do? Um, you know, back when I first started, this is real gray hair. Uh, back in the late 80s, it was more with the personal computers where they actually were gonna see, let's see if we can do something funny. You know, let's all of a sudden make the screen, we'll take over the screen or whatever, and next time they reboot, there's gonna be a, a scary face that pops up. Or they're gonna do that. There wasn't a lot of I guess you can call it unethical hacking. There's nothing ethical about hacking, but it was more trying to do this, and maybe a Trojan horse, you know, maybe something like that. And it evolved into more and more of the malware, and not just being something that was a user group of a bunch of computer geeks that you know decided not to play Doom that night. It actually became more of a business. And there's a lot of things. One of the smartest guys I've ever known. I worked for Cisco for six years. And one of the, the head of security for that was a CIA agent that went around the world and basically busted up crime syndicates of hackers all over the world, mostly in Eastern Europe, that would try to get into you know Sears and you know the Neiman Marcus and stuff. And some of those stories were busting people in parks, getting them to come in, and it was like three 14-year-old kids that were there to pick up the ransom money because they have nothing to do, and so they basically create clubs to try to do that, you know? So the thing is, is again, it's really as far as what the hacker wants to do, but it's still the same threat level. They still get in the same way for the most part. Just a little flood slide, you know? The, the, the fear portion of it, as far as how much you can lose. I mean, obviously, if you look at everything, just trying to get back, I don't know how many of you have had uh, security assessments and risk mitigation. Uh, I was on a, a panel with a couple of uh, really smart guys at the Milwaukee Business Journal uh, last month, and one of the guys was an insurance agent. And he was talking about how many people do not insure against data loss. But if you look into that, just within data loss, PR, all of these other things, that if you lose, let's say, a million files, and it's gonna cost you $250,000, we'll just put a number into that, multiply it times two to clean up your name, to clean up all the other things, and at the same time then start you know, back as far as from almost scratch at times to be able to find out exactly where, you, where it went wrong. And a lot of times people will look for a silver bullet. 
I got this great firewall. It's next generation. I have this, I have that. Well, that's great. And you might have, being an IT person, you're responsible for that. And the CEO of the company is like, I hire smart people. I have IT people that will do that. And it is. You guys are smart. And you hook these things up right. But it's sometimes the outside factor. That's kind of my point today, is some of the outside factors that you have to be aware of. And also, the biggest risk is your own people, right? As far as as far as them having to do it. One of my best sayings that I liked, and I think I probably heard somewhere, it's probably plagiarized it, is how many of you have really secure passwords and everything else, even on your mobile apps or your bank? How many people change, how many do everything else? Okay, you're gonna protect your your checkbook, why aren't you protecting your paycheck and following the security rules is what I tell people for end users. Your paycheck is probably what you have to be even more secure of to be able to lock down. But things like, I mean, I go on forever on different stories, but one of them like is that uh, the people at this sheriff's department was actually then to the town hall, the town hall was sharing internet service with the local Kmart. It was all kind of hooked up. They thought because there was fiber underneath <coughs> that people could break into it and they had secure passwords. Here's one of the things is they were remodeling the jail for a year. The conference room, because the interrogation rooms and everything else were doing, they had it in the conference room as the interrogation, which could not be handled by police officers, it's the lawyers, and sometimes, you know, obviously the, the, the uh, perpetrators or whatever, actors, convicts, whatever you want to call them. Well, the thing is, is that they couldn't, they didn't have security cameras in there. Well, that was also their training device for the time system, which is the criminal database access for the state of Wisconsin. On the whiteboard in the upper left-hand corner was password, or username training, password, training one, two, three. At times, you actually had convicts in jail, not just waiting sentencing or anything, but actually in jail for a while that was still meeting with their lawyers that were sitting there for an hour by themselves with a computer that was on that basically had direct access to Kmart. And it's the same banking systems. And when I was asking them about that and everything else, they're like, well, no, it's all encrypted, it's all fiber. But no, because they're actually logging into the VPN tunnel on that computer with the username and the password. Because the only way you can get into the database system is through a VPN, but you're giving them access to it. A um, lot of other things that you, you know, that people just don't think about. A lot of mobile devices, dealing with colleges and using universities, BYOD is the biggest thing. Network access control is just, it, it costs them more for that than it does firewalls and everything else just because of students. Um, it was funny because one of the local ones right here in Waukesha, Carroll University that I'm uh, very familiar with, they actually had a group that was trying to hack into it, so they turned off some of the wireless service, and they literally went into the ceiling tiles and actually connected up a router and a voice gateway and rerouted it, so they then had to put conduit in. And they weren't doing anything hacking, they weren't trying to do anything, they just wanted to see where they could go with it. But again, if you're hacked into there, my point on that one is, even if you're connected to the network, you can see what the suspicious activity was if you were monitoring correctly. I don't know how many of you have installed or doing it or have it as far as the monitoring system for security. A lot of places that I see, they have this great methodology, great policy, great procedures, great manual. They have the monitoring software, they have all this stuff, and they uh, put it in the drawer after it's installed after about 30 days of checking it. Without proper uh, reporting on there, you're going to be hurt. It's because your internal threats are probably going to hit you twice as much as the externals. Again, you know, personal and professional. You put locks on your door. You have an alarm system. You have all this stuff, the policies and the procedures you follow personally, you need to follow and have your users follow back in the workplace. The best way to do that, empower them with the tools that you potentially already have within your office. This is where I get to the point as far as I don't care what firewall you use, I don't care what filtering, everything else. But the one thing that I've used, again, <coughs> for small business, in cases, it's like tokens, whatever, but if you look at medium, larger size companies, 
How many of you guys have RFID badges to get into a building? Anyone? Yeah. Imagine if I could actually take that RFID badge that's being used, and you don't have to do anything with it, and I can incorporate it into advanced authentication, single sign-on, and everything else within your laptop for about $70 a user, it takes me five minutes to do. It's what I did for the Milwaukee Police Department for 3,300 officers. Is you take something that's already there that the users are used to using, swiping your door, going in for access. Right now, for access on my computer is my RFID antenna, and do it by USB. I swipe that, I put in my four digit PIN, it's like an access for a cash machine, and I'm logged in. It's something that you, <coughs> excuse me, something that you have, something that you know. It's the best security that you can have because they can't even key log or anything else. Because if you don't have that serialized card or a token or even a smartphone app for an OTP, a one time password, they can't be able to break into it from a remote area. Make sense? I mean, that's the one thing that, again, you're using it. But if you bring in something, let's say, like a card or a token or whatever, and it's something people aren't used to using, they may go away from it. But again, everybody, you know, you give it to a kindergartner, and yeah, they could be able to be able to utilize and access the computer product. So that's the first thing. Again, with mobility, more and more things as far as that you're going to want to take your apps, especially Androids, that you want to make sure that your apps are secure and be able to have that access control monitoring within your system. A lot of people are like, well, it's a cell phone. You can't really get it hacked or anything. Well, more and more people are figuring out how to get bad stuff onto our, onto our iPhones and our smartphones. And as you probably all know, Android doesn't necessarily have to clarify. You can put kind of a shareware kind of a thing out there, apps out there, compared to iOS, which has to be uh, qualified by Apple. But again, when you have it like iPads, um, the Surface tablets, a lot of times with that, you have a lot of agencies and a lot of uh, healthcare, for instance, that we did 250 mobile nurses where they can go out and they can to um, access control into that. Well, that's all well and good. There's a number of companies around the state that do that. Well, if you're using Windows operating system, it's just like carrying around the laptop. So you have to make sure that you're going to be secure onto those devices, even if they're not hooked up to the network, as sooner or later they might be. And you have to make it easy for these people to do it because, again, the one company I'm talking about is out of Madison. They have a lot of healthcare providers, but it's a lot of also assisted living, volunteers, dropping off food, doing everything else. When you have something like that within, um, within your department, you have, like I said, volunteers, you have a lot of number of different people signing in, signing out, maybe not knowing the technology, they're using the application. It has to be secure, and you have to make sure that you keep that secure. But again, there's a lot of different ways back to something you have, something you know, that can make sure that it's simplistic for the users to, to use. Gets me into compliance. Oops. A lot of you guys might need to be compliant, HIPAA, PCI, CGIS, any of the other things. Well, some of you probably don't need to be compliant. But what I always like to recommend when I do my security assessments is to still, still follow compliance rules and regulations. It's a good way of setting the bar for what your business is going to have, and it doesn't have you have to go out and get a specialized security assessment document plan and pay for it. It gives you a starting point that has been kind of tried and true, and you can kind of pick and choose what works for you, but it at least gives you a baseline. Healthcare is the big one, obviously. The HIPAA compliance that's a lot of companies have to adhere to. I don't know if you uh, have heard, but insurance companies now that work with vets have to be HIPAA compliant with advanced authentication now. The reason being is because our federal government got hacked and lost, uh, what was it, two and a half million records for veterans uh, within the healthcare system. So now 
with insurance or anybody that works with the veterans onto that has to follow HIPAA regulations. And it started as of April 1st. So I'm meeting with a couple of large insurance companies in the next couple of weeks who are all of a sudden are kind of a little freaked out because it's like, well, we have all this security now, we have all these things, now we gotta follow a compliance issue that we've never even looked into before. The good thing is, is a lot of times, those companies have already done the majority of this stuff and are already on their way. But again, it's just that, you know, in our times, everyone's going to be hacked sometime. It's just a matter of when, how they're gonna do it, what's gonna go on, and if they feel that you're, that you're worth you know, digging into a little bit further. The also thing with compliance, like I've talked about, is convenience. You already have something that's there, and you can also provide an ROI to that. You can go back and say, okay, we are protecting our customer information. Maybe it's not patient care or whatever, but we're doing our customer information you know, for the CFO, the CEO, and protecting that data. Or if you're a small business, or even churches, I do a lot of churches where they process credit cards through a processing company, but again, to be able to protect those links and do everything else, they can't be assured all the time that the vendor is doing their job of protecting themselves. A lot of times you'll have an outside vendor that to no fault of their own, you have a co-location, you have this or that, and somehow a hole develops. And you aren't aware of it, because you don't have the monitor, you're not looking at it. You have to make sure that you're going to be doing that. And that any type of uh, SLA or anything else that you're doing within uh, your process and procedures, that you have testing methodology built into that with, with your vendors. And again, I'm talking about anything from a CCB integrator to a co-location data center, or even Amazon. You know, they probably laugh at you, but you know, make sure that that's all being taken care of to be able to do it. Public safety, that gets back into the whole thing, security. Um, anything that has any data onto it, I use the criminal justice database as an example, but there's many others onto there. And again, that's a gift to be able to support your customers and protect your customers. At the same time, on the ROI of something like that, where you're gaining your ROI is to get the efficiencies for the users, right? Something you have, something you know, they can swipe. Well, the other thing that's probably the best not to, and I'll get into it even deeper, is single sign-ons. Anyone heard of that? It's kind of the buzzword right now. It's a great buzzword, you should use it. If you can actually have, again, the efficiencies that your users are actually doing what they're supposed to, and you can sell it to them, instead of being a walking purchase order in IT, you can actually go into the CEO's office or the chief of police or doing whatever your boss is, and say, I can make our users three times more efficient in signing on, and they're gonna do, and they're gonna follow their sign off and sign on the way that we're supposed to do it all the time, because they're gonna be able to swipe a card or put in a token, or a one-time password, and all eight of their applications that they use for that day are gonna be signed on automatically. They're gonna to have to put in eight passwords. Talk to that like a doctor, a nurse, an accountant, anyone else that you can actually do it. And when it comes to compliance and as far as your security, there's at-rest data where basically somebody walks away and somebody could be hacking into their computer or actually access their computer at that, well, I'm not going to sign off because I just took 15 minutes or I just went to lunch, so I'm not going to do that. Well, that's great. You just put your company at risk, but you give them something that they can just do swipe or just do whatever, and it logs them completely off. They come back to their desk, turn on the computer, they swipe, they put in their four-digit pin, all eight programs come back up. In certain applications in doing testing, uh, I do a lot, again, I keep going back to the police departments, we saved an officer when they get in the squad car 14 and a half minutes per login logout session. Well, that's really good because officers don't really care. You know, there's the ticket writing, there's the logging, and there's the the, the CAD system, all this stuff. Well, they don't like to log in, log off, especially if they're just you know going to stop and possibly write a ticket or do an investigation or, or go to lunch. <coughs> well, that's great, but uh, there's a local police department that had an instance because the uh, officers were not logging off while they were taking their squad cars to get their oil changed at a nationwide chain. And 
they were going across the street and they were having lunch. And it was found later that eight different instances that the assistant manager at this oil change place was putting a USB into the computer and while they were changing the oil was downloading information on people. And one instance it was going to be his soon to be ex-wife and her family trying to find any type of information that was deep down. Because it was wide open, the computer was just open and accessing it. So again, it wasn't someone who was trying to be malicious to it, but it's kind of illegal. And so many instances of it, you know, and where the person actually knew, they could almost schedule the time. Hey, what do you need? Yeah, want to find out something about somebody you don't like? Just tell me, I'll get it for you. You know, kind of a thing. So again, making it ease of use. And on an ROI, if any of you guys are IT support people, Password resets, that's somewhat of an issue sometimes with your users. Trying to make sure, changing passwords. A lot of compliance, you gotta change your password every 90 days. Can't have the same instance for 10 instances. Eight characters with wildcard and capitals that they have to change. They have eight programs and you don't you want them to have the same password and everything onto it. Your help desk is 50% resetting passwords. With this type of advanced authentication with the single sign-on, you can do that, the users can do that themselves. Because again, they can go back in on those passwords. They don't go away, they're just kind of hidden on there. They can go back in as long as they know their PIN, or if they forget that, what's their dog's first, you know, their first dog's name, mother's maiden name, whatever, you know, risk-based. Once they can go and reset that, it saves you guys a lot of time. A lot of time, a lot of money. And even if you do have to reset it, you can reset kind of their pin or their password onto it and force them to redo it. In a lot of cases, if you have 50, 100, 150, multiply that by what you have. It's a pretty easy ROI to get to a CFO and to a CEO. Not only are you now more secure, you're more efficient and your users are gonna do what they're supposed to do to make sure the company's safe. It's a lot different than what IT people are normally going into saying I'm gonna cost you money in this and the people don't, you know, CFO doesn't understand what the heck you really need this for. They just look at it as another box that you're asking to buy. We already talked about this as far as the Windows logon. It's first line of defense. People don't care for it, users don't care for all the changes, all the different things, but that's your first line of defense. When, they, when I say two-factor or advanced authentication, first factor is Windows logon. Second factor is normally you know, the, the card or the token or whatever. You can actually get all the way into four-factor, and that's where you actually have applications. You have to have a special device to, to swipe or to put in, in a pin into an actual application. A well, Windows login is your first line of defense. What an advanced authentication and what that does is it blocks the boot up process. So your username and password is still in there, but you don't have to put it in because again it's single sign on, but you can't even get to that screen <coughs> excuse me, until you do your factor authentication again, I keep saying smartphone, card, token, whatever. So that's where it's more secure because if you can't even go through the boot up process, it's not even at the window screen. A lot of people think it's secure if it's at Windows, but you're not logging in. No, it's not secure at all. You just give them the first page you know, to, to get in. They still get in. Shared workstation is another thing um, that's really popular with law offices and financial institutions. Citrix, terminal server, that type of stuff. The issue with you, that is it's very good for your customers and everything, but you can still get hacked through that through the customer's network. You know, that somehow could be able to like a key vlog or whatever. So what I'd like to say is, I don't know if any of you uh, with companies or whatever, like US Bank started passing out tokens, RSA tokens. And you would actually put, and it changes the number every two minutes. So you'd use your new username, your password would be that token ID. So they were actually giving that to their customers to actually protect themselves and their customers. They did a lot for business accounts and for multiple mortgage accounts. <clears throat> so again, shared workstation is really good and it's going to give you an, a level of security. But I would still even look at advanced authentication. <coughs> Excuse me. 
lot of people, as far as your remote access, using Radius, SSL, VPN, certificate-based, you know, types of uh, ways of authentication, which is very good. And I, I think it's, you know, it's the way that most people really secure things down. And I still think it's necessary. The issue with this is it takes a lot of manpower, a lot of resources to be able to set that up, to continue to get it on, to keep updating, and everything else. So by doing the advanced authentication piece of it, you don't necessarily need all of your certificates, all of your SSL, and all of the other things. Fine. We've talked about this a little bit, as far as what you can use. Um, there's 14 standard ways of authenticating. Onto that, everything from a mag stripe card, which some people have, again, to get into the building, or whatever, or a gas card. Uh, USB tokens, there's a lot of different things. It doesn't matter, other than the fact that my point, what I'm trying to get across today, is you need to make it work within your current infrastructure and your current methodologies in ways that, that you can track also. Another efficiency I forgot about is uh, door access. If you get uh, intrusion, you know, somebody gets in, or like law enforcement or an insurance company or something like that, that unnecessary people walked in, you weren't sure exactly who they were, you actually go and you do an analysis of it. Well, you could, with the same crystal reports that you're doing for the people and access control, you can do for computer access control. It's all built in because, again, you're using the same system, right? Schools, very, you know, right now, I would say probably three quarters of my meetings with school is on securities. Enhanced camera, door access, you know, wireless access, those types of things, more than I want to boost up my network or I want more workstations or whatever. It's more based off of that. And the thing is, is again, if you can incorporate that with teachers at the same time to protect their, their students, or a lot of times that you have like mobile laptops, like in great schools, they have those carts. You know, they got Chrome carts, laptop carts, and everything else. Again, it's to incorporate that into the overall infrastructure. Single sign-on, this is one of my last slides. Again, I think is probably one of the most valuable efficiencies in IT security today. And the reason being is because people buy into it. It's easy to understand. It's easy to create an ROI onto that. And again, especially if you're in IT uh, support roles within your users, within this stuff, you can do, you still all of your remote control software. I did with yours. We can hook up remote control software so you still be able to do that and still going through with the advanced authentication. So you can actually then allow your users to be online, to be on uh, cellular service or Wi-Fi or wherever they're at while they're out in the field compared to today, man, you don't want those guys logging into something. You know, it's, it's kind of funny because of all of us probably, well not all as I won't assume, but I know one of the first things I did was connect to the Miller Park Wi-Fi onto that. And the thing is, is then afterwards, it's funny because Kaspersky's doing a demo hacking Miller Park's Wi-Fi uh, this afternoon. And they actually have a BitLocker virus. I'm like, no, 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 guys, <laughs> let's not go that far. Well, the thing is, is that, you know, somebody could walk in and actually be serious about that, to have, you know, a crypto lock or having something like that. And I'm logged in with my iPhone on 10. My laptop is logged in. <coughs> so the thing is, is that the reason but I do have the advanced authentication because my card's in my bag and you saw my little Wi-Fi here. So they could hack into me, but that doesn't mean I can't necessarily get a virus. I'm just hoping that our IT manager at the office is really protecting me while I'm on to this. But my, you know, they couldn't get past me as far as my device. I, it says save 15 minutes a day on average. How many of you guys have users that have multiple logins? I mean, almost everybody does. Do you require different passwords for each application, or you ask it, but do you think your users are doing it? Yeah, it's, a, it's that same thing. I mean, I'm even guilty of it. One time, my uh, my son, he's uh, at UW Oshkosh now, but I think it was like 14, 15, and he's like, Dad, what's the password for this? Dad, what's the password for this? And finally, for his Xbox, because he wanted to, to get a game. And you have the password, he goes, you realize that's the same password for everything, Dad? Don't you know people can really use that against you? 
So I had my 14 year old give me a security lesson because I was thinking that's my home stuff, you know? Or else the other thing is, is um, I had one where I would have an ET with a number and then at the end, I would change that number. That's how I would change my password. Is one, then two, then three, then four. My daughter found out about that. She could get a hold of me one day. She's at UW Madison and she needed a couple books and we were going to do it. Something happened she needed earlier. She could guess my password because she just kept trying the different numbers in there. But she did send me a text saying she was going to do it. But I mean, it's something like if somebody you know, does it, you don't think about it. You think it's protected because it's, well, letters, numbers, letters, special character. But well, just by saying pattern. it a couple times out loud, somebody can be able to find out. Yeah, there's a pattern. Yeah, and that's what a lot of people use. A lot of people use. So that's kind of what my, my message is. If anybody has any questions specifically about any type of devices or protocols or anything, I get real technical if you want me to. But when I was asked to do this breakout session, I wanted to make it more as far as policy procedure, ROI, again, showing exactly why you can actually go in there and do it and be able to sell that internally to your bosses. Because again, bottom line, to protect your checkbook, you better protect your paycheck or else it's not gonna really matter much about your checkbook. 